good evening everyone thank you for joining us today uh, for this webinar my name is uh, amin fateh i am chief it officer and chief operating officer at avalon university school of medicine before we proceed further for this webinar i would like you to press raise hand button on your screen so we can make sure that you are able to hear us and uh, you are able to see our presentation as well i will wait for a few more seconds so that uh, you can press raise hand button on your screen thank you for your acknowledgement and welcome once again it's a pleasure to have Dr. Ghani with us tonight. Dr. Abdul Ghani is the Associate Dean of Postgraduate Training at Avalon. And we will be taking questions during this webinar and will try to answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. And to ask questions, you can type them in your question box and we will compile all the questions at the end of the webinar and we'll start <coughs> answering them at the end of the webinar. Now I will hand over the session to Dr. Ghani. Dr. Ghani, you can continue. Thank you, Dr. Amin, for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Abdul Ghani. I'm the Associate Dean of Postgraduate Studies. And those of you either have met me during the clinical rotations or I have held several uh, webinars in the past, hope you have attended. Uh, these webinars are very important. They are updated with policy changes and uh, uh, requirements for residency uh, applications for uh, examinations steps steps exams so uh, let's start uh, next slide please uh, the questions has already been mentioned uh, at the end of the webinar i'll be happy to answer as many questions as i can and if you still have any questions at the end please don't uh, hesitate to uh, write on my email and i'll definitely uh, reply to your questions. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we have two uh, important announcements today and the most fantastic news, uh, and we just got it today, and we are all very excited that we got a full ACCM accreditation for six years. And we are only one of the four or five out of 82 Caribbean schools to have this ACCM accreditation. The importance of accreditation, I'll talk about this uh, in a minute. Uh, in addition to this, we also have CAMHP accreditation, which is a, a, a Caribbean accreditation agency. So we are, we are about five or six of the total of 80 some Caribbean schools. Um, and we are the only uh, two schools that have two accreditations, one from ACCM and one from CAMHP. Next slide, please. And this, uh, this slide is just, I'm going to discuss all this in details, but this is a very important slide and very concerning. I want you to pay attention to this. Um, uh, we got this data from uh, after we got the match results this year. And uh, uh, out of this, you'll realize 20 reasons. Uh, only the step scores uh, account for only uh, two of the 20 reasons. And once you take the step exam, you cannot change it anyway. It's unfortunate that we have a lot of uh, reasons that IMGs lack um, in application. And I'll touch each one of them at the end so that you can remember. These are very important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we understand and I realize because I do a lot of research and reading how stressful it is for you uh, to go through this process of examinations and the process of application for the residency. And it's very stressful, uh, but it's necessary. And that's why you're all required to at least know the process, how it works, what is the timeline, what is important, why is it important to apply at a certain time, why is it important to upload your LORs, what type of LORs, all these things are extremely important. Next slide, please. So the importance of accreditation is now called the rule of 2024. This rule was established by ACGME, which is the American Council for Medical Education. And they told all Caribbean schools that you have to be accredited by 2024. Otherwise, your students will not be allowed to apply for residency training or license to practice in US. Now, this is extremely important. Uh, 
I don't know a lot of people don't students don't realize and especially uh, the parents and the families who want their children to go to medical school it's important to know at the time of admission that you're going to graduate four years later with a lot of hard work and uh, financial ha hardship that you're going to become a doctor and if your school is not credited uh, you will become a doctor but will not be able to practice at least not in us now you'll be able to practice in the rest of the world but each country has their own requirements so based on caribbean timeline and the dates those students who started their md1 in 2020 are affected by this rule so it's very important for them to know that by 2024 if their school is not credited they're going to have a lot of problem next slide please i'll uh, i'll emphasize today on the process of application and residency rather than on the exams because dr karan singh last time pretty much covered everything so i'll just skip through and just mention the important points about the usmle steps exams one two and three um, and the NBMEs and the comprehensive exams. So I'll focus my talk tonight more on the process that we are having trouble with. So uh, everybody knows now step one is pass and fail since uh, January 26. And the, uh, and the number of attempts allowed uh, is also reduced from six to four. And the type of content has been changed uh, with, uh, with some more question emphasis on communication, professionalism, ethics, safety, uh, and system based and practice based learning. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, it is important to know uh, what the changes have been uh, with the combined match of the DO and the MD candidates and the schools. Uh, this has increased the number of residency spots. Not enough, but every year we get an increase. And as you can see, uh, in 2020, there was 2,000 plus uh, uh, increase. In 2021, 928. And this year, uh, 1,083. What is important to know, and we are uh, pleased to know because we are accredited, is that California now recognizes uh, accredited schools, and one of them is Avalon. And we are proud to say that two of our students have already matched in the programs in California in 2020-21. I get a lot of questions. Can we apply? What do we have to do? Yes, we have a process. When you apply, uh, they, uh, they like to, the programs like to have a lot of documentation. And our clinical department is prepared to provide you with all the letters, documentation, and copies of recreation to to facilitate, to help you apply and get residency spots in California. So don't hesitate to apply there if you want to. Next slide, please. The national board exams, again, we have gone through this before. Uh, these are good, uh, uh, both comprehensive for basic science and clinical exam. And they are basically a shorter, much shorter version of the actual step one and step two exams. Next slide, please. Um, again, I'll very quickly skim through, uh, emphasizing some important points in this. Uh, see, if you see the comprehensive exams, there are five hour exams, about 200 MCQs in uh, blocks of 50 each. And even the, even the self-assessment exams uh, are five hours, 200 block 50 each. Um, and what I want to remind you, that step one is eight hour exam, step two is nine hour exam, and step three is two day exam equal to almost 15 to 16 hours. And when you're practicing these at home with your Q banks and various resources you use for preparing, you're not at a stretch taking these exams, practice exams. I would strongly recommend that you do because from what I have seen, read and heard, that by the end of eight or nine years of continuous exams, you're really mentally and physically exhausted. So I want you to practice this at home, to take exams for at least, uh, take uh, of, of, of several blocks in the morning, 
and give yourself a break and take several blocks. So it's equivalent to eight to nine hours of exam uh, practice. Uh, the shelf exams are easier. They are much smaller. They are shorter, two hours. Next slide, please. Um, the resources have been discussed before. The only thing I want to remind you is uh, the contents of the step one exam understanding it's only pass and fail but it's very important to keep in mind that majority of the contents are if you don't know now now you should keep in mind the three p's bmn and three p's are physiology pathology pharmacology uh, bios uh, biochemistry and microbiology most of the questions come from this if you do very well on the rest of the topics and don't do well on these you're not going to pass and not going to get a good score so keep that in mind I also want to remind, don't use too many resources. Ideally, one, one Q bank and one book is enough if you can master that. Next slide, please. Uh, we've already mentioned the type of exam. The only thing I have to rem remind you on the step one is from January this year, it's a pass and fail. There is no uh, three digit number that will be reported on your scorecard but the minimum score to pass is 196. Remember that minimum score is, so 196 is also pass and 260 is also pass for step one. Next slide, please. Step two, similar resources have been used. The only thing to emphasize here is uh, uh, on uh, online meded videos. These are short videos. These are very topic oriented. These are good supplement to you world and other book that you want to use choose only one of the books you don't need to choose all remember one q bank one book self assessment exams we've already talked about and six if you look at the uh, contents of the examination for step 2 i'll show you a slide from usmle 60 to 70% questions are i am related next slide please and th this is a slide from USMLE, and this is the examination content for two, uh, step to CK. And you can see medicine, surgery, pediatrics um, uh, comprise almost 80 plus percent of the uh, contents of the exam. They vary year, every year with few questions emphasizing one specialty or the other, but overall the emphasis is medicine, surgery, pediatrics. If you uh, if you really do very well on these, very unlikely you will fail or get a bad score. Next slide, please. Step to CK, we've already mentioned this, the self-assessment exam, there are three of them. You don't have to take all three, but at least take a couple of them. The uh, the UWorld SAW1 and uh, UWorld uh, SA1 and SA2 are good practice exams. They are very short. Um, and the most important one that has come out, the old one is gone now. Now we have a new USMLE 120 questions free. And these are good practice sessions, good learning tools. For the UWorld and the USMLE self assessment exams, don't worry about the score you're going to get. I want you to analyze when you get the uh, your report from taking these exams, find out what the weak points are so you can correct those weak topics and do better in the next uh, next uh, practice exam. And uh, 120 question free, these are very good examples, very similar to what you get on the step to CK. I wouldn't hesitate doing this two or three times, just get into practice of answering these clinical type of questions. Next slide, please. Uh, the, there is a marked difference between one and two. It's all about time management. It's very uh, frustrating, it's demanding, it's tiring, but you have to practice at home. Practice of doing these clinical questions at home. That's why I said do the USMLE free uh, 120 questions two or three times. So you know um, how to uh, read these questions, what is the uh, the important points they are asking um, and uh, try to form while you're reading uh, a way of differential diagnosis and keeping in mind the work of coming to a final diagnosis and practice management. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we have already mentioned the format. The only thing I want to remind here that this is the application of basic science knowledge in clinical practice. And the minimum score has been increased in December this year. They do that every two to three years. So now the minimum score passing score in step to CK is 214. Step to CK has now assumed tremendous importance in the uh, evaluation of a candidate for residency. Uh, it used to be step one score. Now that it has become pass and fail, the the three digit score, which will still be reported in numerical number is the step to CK and all the programs and the program directors will be looking at this number. So in short, step to CK score has now become step one because step one is pass and fail. Next slide, please. Step three, I won't take too much time. It's a two day exam. Here, the only important point to remember is that you have this 13 case simulation. These are practice cases. It's important to go through that. You'll get a clear idea. This is a step much beyond step to CK because it assesses the physician independence and responsibility delivering medical care. Next slide, please. Uh, resources are very similar. Minimal score for step three is 209. This is the most current one. Next, next slide, please. Okay. So now that there's the policy change after cancellation of CS, it has been replaced by clinical attestation or qualification. And to be eligible for this, ECFMG has created six pathways. And uh, I won't go through all six because for Avalon students, number three applies where it says it's, do you belong to a accredited medical school recognized by World Federation of Medical Education and awesome is recognized. In addition to other two accreditations I mentioned, we are also recognized by the World Federation. So those graduates after January 2018 are become eligible and you will get a clinical skills certification from the school, um, uh, but you have to apply to ECFMG. Once you do that, they will send a form to the school and Dr. Arja, the executive dean, will certify you and attest for the clinical skill uh, requirement. So you, those who are prior to, graduates prior to 2018 will now be eligible for number six. This pathway was added last year and this requires mini CX form. It's like a, a mini OSCE. Uh, you have to um, contact a preceptor who will watch, will observe you taking history and physical and fill the form in. And when you have three of these, the ECFMG will certify your clinical skills. Next slide, please. I get a lot of questions. I am a Canadian citizen. I am a US citizen. I am a US born. I graduated in US. It doesn't matter. Unfortunately, you have to take the English language test, OET. It's the occupational English test. And all IMGs, irrespective of the country of origin or the citizenship of origin, will have to take this English test exam. Unfortunately, and I still get calls just last week. I, oh, this is easy. I'm going to take it in July. Unfortunately, we still see a lot of failures in this, in the English test exam. They take it so lightly. Oh, what's a big deal of OET? I can pass this. We get a lot of failures, unfortunately. And without this, you cannot be certified for ECFMG. You cannot get an ECFMG certification. And you, there are four. Uh, sections to this exam, English listening, speaking, reading, and writing. They have reduced this year. It used to be 350, and you have to pass individually all sections. If you fail one, you have to take the exam all over again. They have reduced the requirement for writing to 300 this year, and uh, this is important now. Again, the deadline is December 31, 2022. 
Why is it important? Because it takes longer than any exam you have taken to get the results back. Because there are fewer centers, there, uh, there are a lot of candidates, they are still in the process of developing this online into an online exam. It hasn't happened yet. So at the moment, you have to take it at the Prometric Center. And that's why it takes sometimes two to three months to get the result back. So deadline is 3031. I encourage you to take it in November. Don't even wait for December because by the time you should have ECF chief certification by end of January for you to qualify to be on the rank order list, which is 2nd of March that the programs use to, uh, to list you as a candidate, uh, rank you as a candidate after the interview. So keep these dates are an important and please do not take it lightly. There are resources available online for you to practice this. Next slide, please. Um, how do you now that step two has become the main score that everybody will be looking at? Uh, how do you uh, stand a chance of scoring well on this? Take all rotations seriously, even if you don't like them. I don't want to do psychiatry. I don't want to do pediatrics. I don't want to do FM. I want to do surgery. But as a clinical student, you have to take all clinical rotations seriously because this is the only time you'll be learning about these specialties. Take self exams, extremely important. We have have changed now the importance of self exam on your final grade. They account for 30% of the grade and 70% of the grade is through the preceptor. 10% for the log and 60% for your actual rotation. But the shelf exams can make or break your grade. If you don't do well, you might do very well. You might get uh, A or honors or excellent from your preceptor. And if you don't do well on the shelf, when we combine it and give you a final grade, it will bring your grade down. Not only that, not only that, it is an excellent preparation for step to CK. Please pay attention for each rotation, develop a study plan and take it seriously. It's a good preparation for step to CK. And I am rotation, remember? F step to C CK, 60 to 70% are IAM related. So uh, critical care is very similar. If you can do a, a elective just before your exam, it will really help you with your step to CK. Next slide, please. Just a background as to what has happened in the match. Uh, there is, uh, as I said, increase of 1,883 uh, new positions, 171 new programs, uh, high match rate, um, and they were still over 2,262 positions unfilled, and all those positions go into the SOAP match. I'll discuss about the SOAP match later, and even after the SOAP match, there are still over 300 positions not filled. It just gives you a brief summary as to what the, uh, what the applicants uh, uh, matched into. The US graduates had a match rate of 92.9, is slightly down from last year, it was 94.6. DO graduates, 91.3, they have gone up. Uh, they were 89 and then into 90, now they are 91.3. And IMGs, uh, those with US citizenship have a 61.4, non-US citizens have 58.1. Still, you can see the difference between uh, the US and the DOs. I want to remind you something here. The Don't worry, the competition is not between you or the US graduates or the DOs. The competition is between yourself and the other IMGs. So that's where you have to be excelling so that you fall into that 60% category. Next slide, please. Now, this is important. Now, this is what I was saying about the process, how it works, the timeline is so important. A delay of two to three weeks makes all the difference, whether you get to interview or not, whether you have any chance, whether you will miss a whole year or not. Uh, the, they have already announced the closure of last year, which was 20 uh, at the end of May, 
and um, they have already announced the date but june the june 24th 2022 all the process for the new timeline for residency will be open the portal will be open on 24th of and that's when you start getting your token from oss you download your my rs application that's where you get your rs actual rs application we will be making periodic announcements from our clinical department about these important dates after you have um, downloaded my rs uh, link site and the rs application and you got the token you will be given a number that you will be using throughout this process so from july to august uh, remember september 7th is the application date i'll give that in the next slide but from july to august you are given time to get your cv ready your personal statement research all the programs make a favorite list of your own and get your mspe ready so this is what happens between july and 31st of august you get a list of all ACGME approved programs on FRIDA as well as on Residency Explorer. These are two excellent sites to research the program. Next slide, please. This timeline is important. I have highlighted in different color and there is a reason for it. They have introduced, uh, in addition to the actual ERAS application, they've introduced uh, what they call supplemental ERAS application and it is uh, it opens on august 22nd uh, in august 2022 and it is only for three residency programs for internal medicine dermatology and general surgery and it it closes on september 16 2022 so you get only about six weeks uh, to apply for supplemental ERS application there is a uh, there is a site on the RS application where you click in to, uh, to apply for supplement to RS application and ECFMG will direct your supplemental application to a specific programs. Only three, I am dermatology and general surgery. Here you are given an opportunity to document more than what you have already submitted on RS application cv and your personal application so the candidate gets additional opportunity to sell themselves to these programs next uh, no hold on please september 28th is the date where msps will be uploaded by the programs so you must have all your msps ready before 28th of september because with the click of the button all the programs now on 28th of september will have access to your MSPs. Next is January 31st, 23rd is the deadline for the applications. You don't want to wait, you want to be ready to apply on the 7th of September. You can apply on the 31st of January, but it will be too late for most of the IMGs. The interview dates usually start in the mid-October and go on all the way to January and February in the following year next slide please. timeline i've already mentioned part of it that this is very important rank order list comes out on the 2nd of march so all your certification ecfmg all the documents that we have mentioned should be all ready um, and i have a separate slide which which uh, gives the requirements for ecfmg certification but M March 2nd is an important deadline when the programs finalize the rank order list. Um, March 14, the week of match starts the whole week. It's called the match week and it goes from 15, 16, 17 for the SOAP match and on the 18th of March is the actual um, match day. So uh, these dates are important. Next slide, please. SOAP match goes on, as I mentioned, for three days. Those who have registered with the NRIMP to apply, and once you're registered, you automatically enter the SOAP match. And each day, only for two hours, um, you, you will be contacted. Now, this is important. You do not contact the program 
you do not call, you do not write emails, or in any way contact the program. The, con the programs that are in the SOAP MASH 2263, remember the number, will contact you only through uh, the link. And this is on R3 system. This is, you, you can access this and you keep that open all the time these three days. You get only two hours. The program will say, hello, Dr. Singh. This is program from um, Ohio, Northside Hospital. I have a position to offer to you in internal medicine. You will be given two hours. You have to say yes or no. As simple as that. And if you say yes, that program will be taken out of the list and your name will go on and you'll be matched. If you say no, the program will stay on the list and you will go and compete for the next day because you've refused on day one. You'll go on to in the whole uh, group of applicants to match again. Um, the general advice is as soon as you're offered a position, accept it. Same thing happens the next day. You're again, uh, you'll get a call within two hours. You have to say yes or no. And the same happens the next day, uh, the last day, which is March 17, and the soap ends. So all those who are matched will be taken out. And there is, as you can see at the end of the match, a list is published and you will have access to that. And there are still 300 programs that did not match any candidate. Either the programs themselves pulled them out or there are not enough candidates who said, who kept on saying no till the last day. Next slide, please. Um, I've already mentioned the R3 system is the most important. Keep that in mind and keep that open. Next slide, please. Okay, just a, just a background as to what the most uh, US graduate match in and what you're, if you're well, most welcome to apply to those specialties. If you have the right scores and the most popular ones are plastic, otolaryngology, neurosurgery, thoracic, vascular, medpeds and orthopedics. And you can see the match rate is from 80s to almost 90% match. Uh, the least competitive from the US graduates point of view, this is where you come in, less than 45% of the US graduates match in these specialties, IMP, pathology, family and prelim surgery. So those IMGs who apply to the right side group of uh, programs has a, a stand a good chance of matching if they meet all the requirements of scores and documentations. Next slide, please. A word about the Canadian match. A significant number of our uh, alumni and students uh, belong to the, uh, come from Canada, and some of them apply to Canadian match. That's the Canadian residency match system, it's called. Uh, there is a change in the requirements. It's very similar to USMLE, the MSPs, the personal statements, and uh, the OSCEs and all that, the clinical requirements. They're very similar. The names are different. So it used to be two-part exam, MCCEE and MCQE. Now it is only one exam, MCCQE, and there are two parts to it. You have to take the first part now and pass it. And the second part, you can take it now, or most of the Canadian graduates take it during residency. Like our step three, which most of the US graduates take it in step uh, step three in the, during the residency, uh, but the IMGs preferably like to take it before they apply for the residency. NACOSCI is the National uh, Assessment Exam for Clinical Skills, similar to what we have the six pathway skills that uh, ECFMJ has developed. OSCE, they have an OSCE, like we also have OSCE as well as clinical attestation, as well as the English test. In addition to all this, in the Canadian match, you require to have the English test, very similar to OET, it's called TOEFL or IELT. IELT. Uh, they may not say it in the CAM, but each province require, requires it. So I strongly advise to go ahead and take the test. You may have to upload that result directly to the provinces. MSPR is the same as MSPEs. Personal statement is same and letters of recommendations are same. The Canadian match 
prefers that you have local uh, local LORs rather than all from America where you have done your uh, clinical uh, uh, rotations. They'll accept it, but they would still prefer some local LORs from local preceptors. Next slide, please. Um, the date lines are very similar. It's much more competitive. As you can see the numbers, we had 42,000 applications here. There were 330,000 and we had 39,000 positions while in Canadian MASH there are 3,346 and very few uh, IMG locations, 96% match rate for Canadian graduates. Um, uh, the other difference is they do a lot more electives than we do in, uh, in America. Important to remember, after you have met all the requirements for the Canadian match, each province has their additional requirements. You need to go to their website and find out what those uh, requirements are. Similarly, each program has additional requirement. For example, EM, IM, FM, MIHAC might have different requirements. You are required to go to the respective site and research and find out what they need. Uh, for all Canadian graduates who are applying for U.S. residency, it's advised that they uh, go through ECFMG that help you with getting a GVN visa for the U.S. match. A good resource uh, that is uh, produced by the Canadian graduates for the CAM match, it's called the Matchbook, and uh, you can get this, and uh, it's a good resource to follow if you're applying for the Canadian match. Next slide, please. The timeline is very similar uh, to, to what we have. It used to be before uh, US match. Now all these timelines are after the uh, um, US match. Uh, the portal is open on June 22nd. Uh, the application descriptions are on 19th. You submit your applications and MRPs in 10th of January. And the major difference is our interviews start in mid of October and go all the way to end of January into February. Here, they are only two weeks, uh, two to three weeks limited time for all Canadian uh, interviews and they're all virtual interviews, including US at the moment, they're all virtual interviews. And the match date, uh, uh, the submitting rank order list, is very similar to uh, US March 2nd and the uh, match day in US is 18th in uh, uh, match day in the uh, Canadian match is 22nd. It's called first iteration. The second iteration is very similar to SOAP match. Next slide, please. So those who do not match on the first iteration, they will get an unmatched a list of uh, positions and they can apply for the second iteration, which is similar to SOAP match. There's a deadline and the SOAP match finishes on the 27th of April. Um, our soap match finishes before the actual match, uh, match day, which is March 18th. Next slide, please. Okay, just a few more important points for all IMGs, which is us, you and me. Uh, ECFMG certifies all for all residencies. The requirements are, this is what has changed. Step one score should be there. Step two score should be available before you apply and the clinical uh, skills attestation through the uh, uh, it is certified by dr arja but the form is is available through the ecfmg and all i emphasize all imgs has to pass the oet exam in all four parts you cannot pass a uh, fail one you'll have to take all the four parts again diploma certification after you graduate, we get it from the school. Transcript, you'll get it from the medical school. MSP, you get it from Dr. Arja. But keep the timeline in mind, please. In addition to this, um, CV and personal statement should be available. I've always said, I don't know how many follow, those in MD1 should have a file on CV. And those in MD5 should have the same file updated for four years and when you're MD5, you should be ready with your CV and your personal statement. Personal statement takes several drafts and readings and it takes time, don't take it lightly. Next slide, please. 
whatever specialty you're applied meant, how do you show commitment? What is difference between you and another 100 IMGs applying? How do you stand out? This is how you do it. Research and case reports, start shadowing in the field you're interested in. It is important to do an extra elective in the field of your interest. That means you need additional letters of recommendation. So if you have done uh, 12 weeks of IM, you need to do an additional four to six weeks of IM. So you can get an additional letter of recommendation from a new preceptor, preferably a different preceptor, pre preceptor and preferably, if you can, a different hospital. It's important for you to join student groups showing interest of national organizations and if you happen to be applying to the programs where there is a residency it's important to meet and network with the residents with the chief residents with the associate program directors and the program director showing them interest that you are interested in this program and you will be applying to this program and if they are uh, if they give you few minutes don't hesitate to ask uh, for their advice and the guidance as to how you should do, uh, uh, how you should be applying to the program that they are running, uh, that they are the leaders. Uh, next slide, please. Audition rotations is one way of uh, uh, improving that commitment that you're showing, externships, sub-internships, doing extra electives in that programs, all these show that you're interested in their program. Unfortunately, due to the COVID, all the audition and external rotations were um, suspended, but they have started July, and that's why they are in lot of demand because US as well as IMGs are going after the same uh, sub-internships and externships and audition rotations. Why, why is it so important to do these rotations? Because you will be working and working with and under the chairman, the program director, the assistant program director, the chief residents, the nurses, the whole team, the coordinators, they are so important to impress upon them before the match that you are a good candidate. Next slide, please. And fourth year, we have already mentioned this, this is what we'll be doing. Uh, get ready with step to CK, all IMGs uh, start their interviews in mid-October. Uh, choose proper electives, and all interviews are virtual. We've had webinars on this by Dr. Arja, but it's important for you to practice, practice, practice. I've seen some people mess up these virtual interviews so bad. Just last week, um, we were interviewing someone, and throughout the process, his lower part of the face was cut. It's, it's, it's so simple for you to make sure you have the right the Wi-Fi is working, that your computers or iPads are working, that uh, you have an extra uh, you know, site available in case it fails, and you should actually project the camera and sit down and see what the, the surrounding, the room looks like and what you look like, how are you facing the camera. Practice at home. Next slide, please. Statement, I've said this so many times and there are some important points to remember when you write your statement. Don't take it lightly. It takes at least four or five drafts before it sounds good to you. I have corrected some three page statements that nobody is going to read. What is the format of this personal statement? Um, uh, it needs, uh, it serves a lower part of this slide. It should be one page or maximum one and a quarter page, not more than that. It, need, it needs, sounds good, it should look good, and it should flow good. That's why it takes so many revisions. What do we need on these statements? Why are you interested? Why are you applying to this program? Um, what did you do extra commitment to for uh, that's so different from others? What type of program are you looking for? And what are your future plans? That's where all these should be. And don't try and make up stories. Be honest, because these program directors have read hundreds of these, thousands of these statements. They'll pick up if you're lying. And one, the 
the points to avoid. This is very important. There should be no downgrading of any resident or any program in your personal statement and no mention of religion, politics, ethics. Be simple, honest and straightforward. Next slide, please. This is not from me. Look down, look down here. The program directors and ECFMG has sent this to us. Do's and don'ts of writing a personal statement. Next slide, please. Um, this, uh, this is obvious. Show co commitment and passion. Why do you want to practice? What is your personal acceptance? What are your goals? Why should you be in this program? What special qualities do you have? Be honest and honest and honest. If you lie, it's a red flag. They'll pick it up. Proofread. I said, you know, draft, draft, draft. Read several times till it's, you have your eyes closed and somebody is reading in and then you suddenly say, that's it. That's my personal statement. Remember, it's your personal statement. Let others re read it, but not write it. And I mentioned how long it should be. Next slide, please. Don't. Don't don't copy. There are a lot of uh, uh, agencies online for a uh, for a hundred dollars. They'll write it for you. But these are all templates. Easily easily picked up. Your friend and family should not be writing. They should be helping and listening rather than writing. Don't list all the accomplishments in the personal statement. They all go in your CV. We already mentioned about. Uh, religion, politics, don't mention time off and salary. Don't write anything negative about anyone and don't rush. It takes time. Next slide, please. What frequently questions that are asked in the uh, uh, the uh, students are asking me as well as uh, everyone else. When should I start applying? Uh, when should I start the process? I got this last week and I've said so many times start on MD1 day of orientation. You have given all the information. Start gathering that stop gathering that start your CV file on your computer. You guys are all very good uh, with your computers. You shouldn't be any difficulty. Right. Start writing CV. Keep updating every six months. Uh, and by the time MD5 comes, you should all be ready. You shouldn't be starting in MD5. Start the process MD1. You are required to know the process of residency application. So go on site, find out what is needed, what is required, what is timeline. I get all this information is available. The only thing different I do is put it in the format for package and try to emphasize the timelines, the deadlines, the importance. That's what I am doing, and I keep reminding you. So don't procrastinate, don't wait. Start in MD1. How should I start the process? Getting to know the process. When should I apply? As soon as possible. And I'll tell you why in the following slides. Where should I apply? We've already mentioned. You can research the program in Frida and Residency Explorer. What specialty? We already mentioned what specialties are popular. And even the ones that are popular with the US graduates, if you have the scores and documents, by all means apply. Uh, do I need uh, OET? I've mentioned yes. It doesn't matter whether you're a citizen or not. You have to pass the English language test. How many? This is a common question asked. And some of the uh, uh, applicants, our graduates that have not matched, have not sent enough applications. It's unfortunate you have to do it. But as an IMG, the minimum average is 150 plus. And what if I don't match? I'll try and answer the question at the end. Next slide, please. Where to apply? We've already mentioned this uh, type of program, faculty, satisfied residents. Now, please listen. We have been saying this for two to three years. We have developed a list of Avalon graduates that have already matched and are doing a residency, and some have already graduated from the residency. We have this list in our clinical department. Not only that, we have a list of subspecialties. So you want to apply for IM, you'll get list of all the programs that Avalon graduates matched in IM. 
a common sense tells us you should at least apply to these programs that you stand a better chance of being interviewed and match. We have this list. Please get that list and make sure out of those 150 applications, all these programs are included when you apply. Next slide, please. This is not from me. This is from American Medical Association. Important tips for IMGs. Remember I said apply as soon as possible. Why? Because 65% of letters of interview are sent out by mid-October. This end of October is late now. It's changed. The date has changed. And remember the MSPs are uploaded on the 28th of September. And within two to three weeks, 65% of the letters are gone. So if you are late, you will fall in the category of that 35 remaining uh, positions that are available. The rest are already gone. That's why it's so important to get your scores, your documentations, um, everything that I've already mentioned in the previous slides ready before the 7th of September when the ARES application opens. IMD friendly, you can get this from the database, from ACGME, from Frida, from Explorer, which, and I'll also show what uh, specialties and what states are important. IMG friendly specialties, IMG, FM, pathology, neurology, for, uh, surgery and pediatrics. Uh, interpersonal interaction, don't fake it, don't lie, be natural, be yourself, ask questions, ask for help from your residents and your directors. And lastly, don't let a bad result that it a failed match keep you away, keep yourself busy working. How do you keep yourself busy? 18th of March, you know, you did not match. In fact, you know, a couple of days before, those who match you know two days before that and you wait and you wait and wait and then you wait another month because by in may end of may the soap match is finalized we just heard for yesterday from a uh, candidate who matched so now from match onwards till september coming september um, uh, march uh, may uh, April, May, June, July, August, September. You have six months here, and you have got another four months before the next match rank order list comes out in March. So you've got a total of six to nine months to do what? This is what you do. You do extra rotations. You do find out and do extra electives in your field. This is the time to do the research. This is the time to do publish. And this is the time to do step three. Time to do all you want to do as many rotations the bottom line is have to be clinically involved you can't just sit at home and do nothing you have you have to show in the next cycle the program director what is the difference from last year that i did not match and you have to show all that next slide please this is not my i told you this is from uh, NRIMP, the matching program. Look at the first two. Uh, by October, mid-October, 47%. And 1st of October, uploaded 28th of September, your MSPE. They are already started sending. So by mid-October, 65% of the letters of interviews are gone. From November onwards, it's all downhill. Next slide, please. Okay, so what about the, I just got this recent data from the match results. The 10, I picked up the 10 most friendly states. They had the data for almost 30 states. And this is so glaringly important. Look at the numbers, look at the numbers. The total IMG is implied to close to 12,000, close to 13,000, out of which 7,670 matched, right? So those, of uh, our graduates lucky who matched we are grateful they are within that 7600 number but look at the next one 5669 70 percent of this 7600 
come from these top 10 states? The IMGs that match. New York, Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Texas, California, Illinois, Ohio, Massachusetts. I, like I said, there is data available up to 30 states all the way down to double digit and single digit. But I picked up the top 10 IMG friendly states. Please keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Okay, so till now, this is this is 2020 uh, result from the program director survey provided by the ECFMG. There is one, it happens every two years, but because of the COVID, they decided to do again uh, in 2020, 21 and 22. So they back to back. The survey results are almost very similar. That's why I haven't changed the slide. The only difference here is they're not going to have from this year onwards, step score number one, 93%, because it will be pass and fail. I can guarantee that will change and step two CK will go on that number one. So these are the top 10. Again, there are about 30 factors that they have studied. I have picked out only the top 10. Uh, step one score, pass and fail, letters of recommendation, Dean's letter, which is MSPE, step to CK, grades in your clerkships is important. If you fail in your uh, IM and you're applying for IMA, that counts. That That's very personal statement. I've repeatedly said so many times, class ranking, we don't do the class ranking. Number of attempts failed, it's important. That's a, that's a no-no, that's a red flag. Next slide, please. And completely change. Once they have sent a letter, they have studied your file. They've studied all the documents, the results, the scores, the letters of recommendations, the MSPs. They don't need to see that again. Now, when they come for interview, they want to see where they can rank you. A totally different category and totally different factors. Interaction, how do you get along? during the interview how do you communicate um, uh, the interpersonal skills interaction with the house staff if they're on the um, either before or after if you communicate with them Fe the feedback from the residents is extremely important especially the senior and the chief residents your step two scores again letters of recommendations come back again the scores come back but after all the other uh, features, the interaction, the team, how, how do you belong, be a team member? How do you, in, uh, you know, interpersonal uh, relate to the residents, to the nurses? The most important of all these are the clinical coordinators. Remember that. Next slide, please. And finally, I have this list that I've been presenting every two months, every webinar for last three to four years and some students still say we don't know the list exists. Uh, so I'll very quickly go through, and the reason for going through is there are certain states that do not recognize Avalon graduates for rotations, but every year the Avalon graduates match in those states. So I want you to keep that in mind because these are the states that belong in the group the 10 most friend IMG friendly states that I had the slide on. So just give, to give you an example and run through very quickly, Florida, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. These are the ones that do not recognize our graduates, but they match our graduates. They don't recognize our graduates for rotations, but they match our graduates. They like our graduates and they make them residents in their states. Florida, Pennsylvania, New York, New York. Next slide, please. Highlighted, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. Texas, New York, Pennsylvania, New York, New York, Texas. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, Texas, New York, what was this? Oh, uh, these are new ones, Idaho and Connecticut. Next slide, please. Oh, this is full of red lines. They don't like us to give rotations, but they love our graduates. They give them, they give them residency spots. That's what they want. So I am, but these are all part of that num the 10 friendly states I mentioned. Pennsylvania, Florida, Pennsylvania, Florida, Texas, 
UPMC. That's a PA, Pennsylvania. Uh, one of our residents matched in UPMC this year. New Jersey, Florida, East Florida. Next slide, please. Same 21, uh, 20. Next slide, please. All red, red marks highlighted. Next slide, 21. Same story. They don't want our students to rotate, but they love our students to apply there so they can get residency. Next slide, please. 21, next slide. 22, same story. Florida, next slide, please. Illinois is part of the New York, New Jersey, Texas, Canada. Next slide, please. So it, as you can see, our rose, we are happy and proud. Our residents are all over. You know, 20, 30 some states, they, they get residency. So at least the apply to those top 10 friendly states and at least apply to those programs that our graduates have done residency and most of them have graduated and some are still in residency. Okay, interview process, we've already done this. Dr. Arja had a great uh, webinar on this. Practice at home, practice, please. Next slide. Common questions asked during the interview. Tell me about yourself. Be prepared, please practice at home with your sibling, your father, mother, friend, whoever. Uh, tell them to take an interview. We have mock interviews we are offering. Dr. Arja, Dr. Wilson and myself, we give more mock interviews and some uh, candidates have benefited, those who got residency. Oh, what, are, what are you looking for in my residency? Um, what are you going to do after the resident? How do you handle you know, disagreements? This is a common theme. What kind of voluntary work have you done? Do you like traveling? Do you like anything else apart from uh, reading about step exams? Do you have any other uh, outdoor or, uh, activity? Do you have any hobbies? Why do you want IMFM? You have to justify why you want it. How are you going to be a good team member? Are you going to be constantly complaining or are you going to work as a team member for the benefit of the team and the patient? What do you do for fun, the hobby, smile, always be nice, look into the camera, don't look here, left and right where you're talking to them, give them the respect that they deserve. And please, if you happen to be personal or otherwise talking to the residents, no four letter words, keep them at home. Next slide, please. Okay, now I want to go a little bit detail. I know we're passing the hour, but I'm almost at the end now. Uh, I had given you a summary, 20 reasons why IMGs don't get interview. If you don't get an interview, the program cannot rank you. That means they haven't talked to you. So what are the features that are keeping our graduates who have decent scores, have all documents ready, are ECFMG certified, and still don't get an interview, not a single one, after applied 100 programs? And this is what I am told and I've researched, I have seen this data, this is why you don't get. And out of this, what is interesting, only top two of the 20 is about your scores and how did you did your exams and all that. The rest is all process oriented. And this is what I want to emphasize on. Please pay attention, do your own research, and this is the guideline. I am going to tell you about the reasons. Step one, step scores. Low scores, it's obvious. If it's very low, you know, you don't compete with the rest of the IMGs. So you cannot, you won't get a letter, you won't match. It's become so important now, the step to CK. It's become so important. Forget about if you had a low score on the step one. Pass fail has already been introduced. You have no choice. To be competitive, you have to do very well on step to CK. And my number now, especially those who have done poorly or have a low score or have attempts, you have to have at least 230 plus on your step to CK. Nothing less than that. Um, RS application, it's a, it's just a stressful and lengthy process, but read about it, learn about it. Listen to what we are trying to help you with. Uh, inaccurate entry. When they are reading the application, if something inaccurate, it tells you how irresponsible you are. 
making errors on the application, incomplete. There are certain areas you're required to fill. And if you do not, it's an incomplete RS application. Your marks, your scores could be great, but if they see these kinds of mistakes on your RS application, they'll keep that application by the side. Profile, there is big gaps. You have to explain why there is such big gaps. Don't lie, tell them the truth. The financial reasons, health issues, family problems. Tell them the truth in your a brief mention in your RS application so that they remember in your and when you write the personal application as to why there is such a big gap. You have to mention that in your RS application. There is a column column there. Why does why is such a big gap? Tell the truth, don't lie. ECFMC violation. This is what I was referring to, and they are finding it more and more in IMGs. Not only that you're taken out of the match, you're totally disbarred from the match, sometimes permanently, and that is trying to contact the program in the SOAP match. Remember, you cannot call, you cannot talk to anyone, you cannot write an email, just leave it alone. When the SOAP match, the only contact you have can somebody say what it was? R3 system. That's the only way you communicate. R3 system. Remember that. Next slide, please. The remaining 20. Personal statement. I talk about personal statement so many times. MD5, you should have it ready now. Don't wait for it to finish because you will be drafted. You'll be revising that so many times. And how to write it? We already mentioned, we gave you a guideline. ECFMG told you what to write and what not to write in your personal statement. So get on with it, MD5, start writing. I just heard from a MD4, not MD4, I just heard from a clinical student who in his fourth year, he said, I'll be writing my personal statement. I didn't. I told him, you know, I, this was exchanged through the email. I said, you should have written that several months ago, if not a year ago. Plagiarism, don't copy. And how to write, don't, not to make it interesting. If you, if your first two paragraphs are interesting, I'll finish reading your personal statement. Next one, apply to, but okay, this is the problem. This is the problem, guys, listen. When you're applying to multiple specialties, you're applying to FM, you're applying to PEDS, and you're applying to IM. The statement should reflect that. You can't use the same statement for all three specialties because you have to sell yourself showing why you want IM, why you want FM, and what else extra have you done to be better than the other applicants. So a personal statement has to be different. Letters of recommendation. This has happened. This has happened to two or three of my uh, students that I have counseled. You're applying for IM, and there is no letter of recommendation from IM. Remember, I, I have repeated so many times, you're allowed four letters of recommendations for each application. Most programs accept three, but you're allowed four. Out, out of these, two letters of recommendations should be in the field that you're applying for. So I've had a student who's applying for IM and they don't have an IM letter of recommendation. They're from, uh, you know, some subspecialty, uh, radiology, uh, you know, all these. So you must have at least two showing that you're interested. And those two separate preceptors writing a nice letter of recommendation for you. Generic, this happens uh, quite often, and especially some of the preceptors say, you write it, I'll correct it. It becomes a generic letter. Th there's no such thing. Wave your letter of recommendation. You have an option, wave them. Let your preceptor write it and let him upload it into the program to the ECFMG. Now, those who are applying from uh, within states, there is no problem. Those who are applying from out of states, you need local, just like Canada, you need local letters of recommendation. Clinical experience, you, uh, you don't have to worry. 
uh, our students and graduates have all local, but those who are coming from abroad need local. That's why for applying for Canadian match, you need to do at least some rotations, clinical rotations in Canada. So, uh, when you are uh, ex researching the site, find out what they require. Some programs require minimum three months of USC, uh, USCE, that is your clinical experience. Some require six months. You don't have to worry because you have got all the experience in U US. Next slide, please. And uh, too late, I have said so many times, and the reason is AMA said, the data said, 65% of the application applicants receive their letters for interview by mid-October. The applications opens on the 7th of September this year. By mid-October, 65% of letters are already gone. So if to up to you and up to us to help you to get everything ready by before the 7th of September. Some programs want special, specific, we already mentioned, some prefer Spanish speaking. So, uh, US, uh, USCE is the US experience, you don't have to worry. Minimum step course, some scores, most of the programs may not say it, but most of them want minimum scores is now 220, minimum. In some specialties, you, go, you can go on there in the website and each specialty has a specific requirement like plastic mentioned, remember the US, theirs is 250 and above on, on step two, step one and step two CK. Similarly for IM, it's all, it's all in the range of 230, 240s now. It's become more and more competitive. Step two CK has become very important. How many uh, uh, programs should I apply? Unfortunately, some of the students are still not applying enough number of programs. I know it costs, I know it's time consuming, but as an IMG, unfortunately, we have no choice. I would say not minimum 100, that has gone up to 150 now. No concept of process, often late. Please do your homework about the process of application for residency. We are doing it, we are trying to help you put it together into a package, but you have to do your own homework also. Lack of follow-up, once you have applied and make sure you follow up with the programs with writing emails or calling, you're allowed, not for the soap match, but you're allowed to contact programs if there is a change, if you have uh, another letter of recommendation, upload it. If you have passed step three while you were waiting, uh, let them know, make sure you let all the programs know. So you're allowed to program to contact them. And remember, the most important person is the clinical coordinator. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is unfortunately often the question because remember 60% match, 40% don't, what do we have to do? And this is recommended and recently I did a, attended a seminar and this is what the uh, the ACGME and the AMA is telling us. AMA is telling us, what if I don't match? We said that already, don't give up. Now you have nine months to improve yourself so your application is quite different from the one you did not match. Continue to get clinical assessment. This is most important, as many as you can. Or the more letters of recommendation, the nice ones you have in your specialty, the better you will be. Take step three exam. Most of the US graduates take their residency. They are required to pass in the first two years of residency. Otherwise, the ACGME does not allow you to progress and you'll be kicked out of the residency. So the program director is looking at the IMG said, oh, this guy already has a step three. The other guy doesn't. Scores are the same, documents are the same, LORs are the same. You will get the preference if you have step three. Research and publication, this is the time. You have got eight to nine months left now. Consider, seriously consider enrolling. You may not, we know masters takes almost 18 months to two years to finish. 
but there are a lot of online courses available even showing interest that you have enrolled into the program and finished down the line in 18 months is a plus mph and mba and proper counseling get hold of a person who can counsel and you help you next slide please uh, thank you letter i've already mentioned you should write it to everybody you've interviewed with when you're doing a virtual interview make sure you keep a card uh, a paper and a pencil write their names down so when you write the letter of thank you letter don't say uh, dear mr uh, program director dear coordinator you better mention their name dear doctor so and so um co clinical coordinator is an important one to write to thank you letter that miss or mrs find out who it is if if a resident or chief resident interviewer you better know the name of the resident so you can write a nice thank you letter next slide please finally we need feedback we need to know and i get it from when i hear from the students counseling i hear from them and i say why didn't you do it why didn't so we need your feedback what what, what else would you like help from us as a, from the school it is important you may not realize it but every time i have a webinar there is a change there's a considerable change because i update all the new policies all the new requirements and as as i did with the uh, new img requirements uh, they'll this will be repeated and uh, keep on updating every time so please give us the feedback and if you cannot do it um, then you have my email available, you can write to me. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar. And if you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer. And uh, Dr. Fateh will moderate and read the question for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tani. Uh, let me take a look how many questions we have received so far in the background. Okay, so. Yeah, here are the questions. Uh, Dr. Ghani, uh, let me yep. know when you are ready so I can start uh, from the first question. I can ready. I'm listening. Okay. Uh, will the full uh, will the full new accreditation allow us to get rotation in New York State, Dr. Ghani? No. Um, see, that's why I said there are certain states don't allow our students. The reason is each state has their own requirements. This. Uh, Accreditation only helps with the ACGME and all the programs in US, uh, uh, the local accreditation body for US and Canada is LCME. But, and LCME uh, accepts the accreditation for 10 to 12 other accreditation agency and two of them that we are accredited, the Avalon School is ACCM and CAMHP. So it's not the states and it's not the programs, it's the crediting bodies and the governing bodies like NRIMP, World Health Organization Directory, World Federation of Medical Education, all these bodies recognize our accreditation. Oh, next question. Do we need to take OSCE? And could you please mention the three evaluation from clinical rotations one more time, please? Yes, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mention, but uh, uh, OSCE is a graduation requirement. Uh, there has been change in policies that all the clinical students and the basic students are now available, are aware, uh, aware of, they're available on their uh, handbooks, uh, clinical handbooks and student handbooks, and they have received email notifications on this. So for uh, USLA step one, is mandatory to pass to advance to clinical rotations. Step two, CK, is mandatory for you to graduate. And in addition to that, you have to pass the OSCE exam to graduate. Uh, what was the second half of the question? Uh, and could you please mention the three evaluations from clinical rotations one more time? Three evaluations. Three, uh, three. Number three evaluation. Yeah, three. No, well, um, for clinical evaluations, you you need to get uh, letters of recommendations for uh, all the preceptors that you work with. 
when you apply for residency on the RS application, for each application, you are allowed four letters of recommendations. And out of these four, two should be at least in the field of your interest. Um, most programs will even accept just three instead of four uh, letters of recommendation. So when I mentioned three recommendation, letters of recommendations, they should be in the field of your interest, two of them at least. So if you're applying for an IM program, you can send three or four letters of recommendation out of which two should be pre preceptors who you have worked in internal medicine. I hope I have uh, answered your question. If not, don't hesitate to write to me to clarify it. Next next question, please. Uh, if September 28th is when program can start viewing, what if your step to score is pending? Can you still apply and submit and update them with the score later? Yes, oh, a good question. Oh, yes to all of them. But remember, for an IMG, it is better to have scores ready when you apply. Yes, you can, you can, uh, uh, you, you can upload the step two score in October, in November, in December, but it's very unlikely that based on your step one score or pass or fail, you're going to get a letter of interview or even considered for a ranking uh, and waiting for your step two score to come up. That's why I'm saying the timeline is so important that as an IMG, you must have your to standard really good chance you must have your step one score and step two score now if you it takes it takes four to six weeks to get the score back so even if you have taken it in mid mid august i am hoping you will get it by the end of september before september 28 um, and if not the latest date i would say is within the maybe first two weeks of october because the uh, you, sh you should plan it in such a way that you get your results back in first two weeks of October because you'll still hopefully fall in that 65% category. Is Next. there a certain amount of time you can apply to match? If SOAP match also doesn't work, how does the process work? You, you can apply anytime. The deadline for uh, application uh, for a for the main match, the ma it's called the match, uh, is 31st of January. If you send applications after that, that will be rejected. For the SOAP match, you can apply, uh, the, once you're registered, you'll be automatically in the SOAP match. And if you do not match in the SOAP match, there will be a list available of unfilled positions even after the SOAP match. Remember, don't, don't contact, don't do anything during the SOAP match. Don't get any trouble. But as soon as the soap match is over, which is 17th of um, 17th of March, then there will be a list published. You should go on site and find out. There'll still be some program. Like in 2022, there were 311 programs still did not match even after the soap match. You are allowed to contact those programs. Next, uh, next question, please. When is the latest we can be ECFMG certified? Okay, that's a very good question again. It used to be up almost May of that year. That means even after the match, that has all changed now. The programs now are requiring that you be ECFMG certified before they finalize the rank order list. So the rank order list comes out on the 2nd of March. So when they see your name there, they also need to see right next to it, ECFMG certified. And I've already mentioned what is required. So what we are saying to our Avalon graduates is you should be certified by end of January, maximum minimum of February. You don't want to wait till the end of February and just in case you, you, you're not certified, you'll miss the rank order list. So let's move back a little bit as a safety um, uh, line, a date, uh, let's say, end of January 1st or mid till the mid of February is the latest date. I would prefer that you are certified by December or January. Then you don't have to worry. And you know what you require. I'll repeat again. Step one score, step two score, OET, um, clinical attestation, transcript, graduation, 
diploma of graduation MSP. You need these to be certified. Next question, please. How much it would cost to send 150 applications? Okay, there is a, there is a different cost for each number. The first 90, I don't have the exact dollar date, and then after that, it starts coming down. So uh, I, I think it's around 30, 30 dollars or 40 dollars. Yes, it is expensive, uh, but I think the average requirement for IMGs has gone up now. It's up to 150 programs. But the but the cost is is mentioned. Uh, if I'll in my next webinar, I'll make sure I get that cost. And but it is available on the uh, on the uh, site uh, when you go in ECFMG and uh, look for the cost of the uh, application. They start with 90 and they and they go on in incremental. The co the cost changes. Next question, please. What is your opinion on applying to IM and FM at the same hospital? You can, you can if you want to. You can apply to different hospitals also. More and more students are doing. There's no harm in that. But make sure your letters of recommendations and your personal statement reflect that. I have already mentioned why the uh, IMGs don't get interviews or match. And one of the thing is long wrong letter of recommendations and no mention in the personal statement as to why you want to apply you're, you're sending the same personal statement to im and fm and every every other program so make sure you individualize the program and the personal statement and the letters of recommendation next question please is psychiatry not img friendly dr abdul Ghani? Psychiatry is not IMG friendly. No, I mean it is, um, but there are there is more demand these days on psychiatry and uh, emergency medicine. So more and more US uh, programs, uh, US graduates are applying. the The data from the USME suggests the general impression is yes, psychiatry is IMG friendly, uh, but it's more competitive. The data from the recent match suggests that uh, I am family medicine, pediatrics, neurology, and general surgery are more where the IMGs have matched. But I, I would, uh, in my slide the, in the IMG friendly programs, I've mentioned, I think, uh, psychiatry. Next question. What is the best approach on how to ask for a LOR during the rotation? Great question. You know, you need to work two, three weeks, and in all uh, rotations, you get midterm evaluation. And take that seriously. Don't hesitate to ask questions in the midterm. If he's not giving you midterm, well, ask some relevant questions like, uh, uh, how do you find my performance here? Where do you think I should improve? Can you please give me some advice? They're just two or three questions. And then after you have received the midterm in the last before the rotation is over, say in the I would say in the eighth or tenth week, ninth or tenth week of 12 week rotation and in the maybe uh, fourth or fifth week of your six week rotation, uh, if you've had good relations with your preceptor, you've had good communication, you have had good interchange, then when he's free alone, uh, then say, Doc, doctor, sir, miss, madam, can I please have a minute? I would, I have an, you now be humble now. Don't be demanding and arrogant. Say, I have really learned a lot and enjoyed your rotation. I would like, I would really appreciate and be honored if you can give me a letter of recommendation because I'll be applying to internal medicine programs and family medicine programs or whichever program you're asking for. And uh, make sure you're ready with it. This is my uh, email address and this is my phone number. And I'll, and if he says, no, 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 write to me, then write to him and get, make sure you give the contact information. Your name, the, and if, if uh, confirm it on your email, date of rotations, it will be on your evaluation form. It will be on your 
um, uh, you know, evaluations that we get in the clinical department, but remind him, write him uh, that you rotate in from so, so much date to so and so date, your name is so and so, you're an Avalon student. Some preceptors have other students from other schools. Make sure you mention you're an Avalon student and then contact number and the email address. So it's good to ask during your rotation and ask very nicely. And what you have to do, because there is a big gap between your rotation and the ARS application. So remind them uh, a month or two before to send their, uh, the, and remember we said wave the, uh, wave the LORs for you to read. So they will directly upload it into the uh, site that is recommended for the letters of recommendation. So this is when you ask, this is how you ask, but make sure you give them all the information for them to contact, contact information. Next question, please. How important is the clinical rotations GPA? If student gets a 3.5 GPA for core, uh, are they in a better standing than the student with a 3.2 GPA? Um, you know what, in our evaluation, we don't have a GPA uh, uh, as a grade uh, for clinical evaluation. Um, we have uh, we have a numerical grade which comes in percentage out of which 30% is a, a NBME shelf exam, which is extremely important. And the remaining 70% is preceptor evaluation out of which 60% is actual preceptor with clinical rotation and 10% is uh, a, a submission of the clinical logbook during your rotation. So we don't calculate the GPA, we calculate um, uh, in the uh, in the form of percentage that is uh, uh, that is finalized uh, from clinical rotation and shelf cream it's not a gpa now failure in any rotation is a negative and uh, the if they are if they are uh, the program is only looking for your clinical rotation and not your shelf copy then that is evaluated in the form of failed poor, uh, average, excellent, and honors. Okay, next question, please. How difficult is it to match with a big gap for someone? It's it's not difficult. It's not difficult. Some people have big gaps. Uh, like I said before, be honest and tell them the truth as to why there is a big gap. And there are several reasons, and we've already mentioned that. Don't hesitate. You know. The, um, one of the uh, students who got matched this year, uh, the student said, I had a big gap and uh, uh, she, she was uh, pregnant and then she got into complications and that's why I couldn't take my exam. And I said, should I say it? Should I mention it? Is that a negative? And I said, no, you say exactly what you wrote to me in the email or told me on the phone, but in a short form, don't write a, whole paragraph or a story, but you uh, meant to carry the uh, impression as to what has happened, but be truthful. <clears throat> and even if you have mentioned it in your personal statement and in your CV, they don't need to read the whole CV, then they knew why there is a big gap. But you have to be honest and there should be an explanation. And if they bring it up at the time of the interview, tell exactly what I told you, be honest, Tell them, and most important, turn it around into a positive one, that big gap. Tell them, what did you do to rectify after that big gap? How did you make an extra effort to correct that big gap? How, what extra did you do? Um, reading, writing, rotations, exams, to that you could not do during the gap. So you have to turn that into a positive feature. Next question, please. How many publications we need to apply for specialty like OBGYN and radiology? And yeah. how we should approach to physicians during our rotations? Good. Again, uh, good question. Yeah, yeah, there is no fixed number. It varies from specialty to specialty. I would say on an average, if you have one or two, that should be enough. But uh, how do you do it? We have a research department. In the basic sciences, Dr. Lambo is the chairman. Uh, 
If you have any during the basic sciences, great. You go through your uh, faculty, uh, basic science uh, preceptor and to, through the research department. If you're in the clinical uh, rotations, during your rotations, you uh, talk to your, if you're doing with the residents, talk to them. If there is any project going on that you would like to participate in research. If you find any specific case or uh, an unusual or rare case uh, that you find during your rotation, uh, do research on it and then contact your preceptor. Preceptor is not going to come to you and say, Dr. Uh, Hi, Dr. Smith or Dr. Patel, uh, uh, I want you to do this. He doesn't have that much time. He's got his own practice, he's teaching, he's uh, working. So you have to be proactive and find the topics and say, I have all, and you have to do the research. I have already done the research on this topic. This is the format I would like to publish on. Uh, hand it over to him and say, I would like your advice and guidance. This is how you'll get your case cases presented or uh, review of literature or analysis or meta-analysis, whatever it is. You have to do the homework, then approach the preceptor. Or you can say, do you, uh, you can approach the preceptor or the chief president and say, do you have any publication or project going that I would like to help with or participate in. So this is how you do it. Next question, please. Can Avalon student now get license in New York State after residency? Okay, I get these questions so many times and I'm glad you brought it up, but uh, licensing and residency is two totally different issues. And each, uh, each state has their own guidelines and requirements for licensing you to practice, allow you to practice in their state. Okay, good example, New York. New York, since it does now allow our students to rotate in their uh, state, but they matched our students. So you can finish your residency in New York. And when you apply to the licensing body, which is totally different, it's got nothing to do with the residency. It's a totally different body. Their requirements are different for each state. So you apply to New York state for license to practice in New York state, most likely they will reject it because you do not meet the basic requirement of graduating from a certain school. But there are um, more than I would say 80 to 90% of the states that will accept it. So my answer has always been, and I encourage students that they should apply in New York to all the programs. Why? Because it has the largest number of programs in the country. And every year they have matched our student. Uh, our students, our graduates. So go ahead and get the program, get your residency, graduate from a residency and practice somewhere else. You don't have to practice in New York. Now, if you have to, then they may not, most likely they will reject it. You can go to New Jersey, you can go to Florida, Texas, New York, California, anywhere and practice. So there are some states that do not accept our graduates, but will accept our graduates for residency, may not allow license to practice. Each state has separate requirements. You have to research on each state and find out what they need. Next question, please. Does it look bad to not match the first time? Does it decrease the chance of matching when you enter the next match? No, no. Remember uh, those two slides I said, don't give up. There are several reasons. It is very unfortunate that 18 of the 20 reasons are process related rather than score related. Yeah, yeah, you had a low score, that is very obvious. If you have several attempts, that's very obvious. But if you take the rest of the 18 of the 20 reasons, none of them are bad. If you don't get match, remember, don't give up, but you have to show what, how hard you have worked how you have made improvements. We had 
um, last week we had a match through the soap who graduated in 2013. So what did he do? He probably, I, I mean, I don't know the details how he got matched, but I can bet on it. He really worked hard and showed the difference even in graduating in 2013, 2015 that he got matched. So don't don't give up, but you have to make a sincere effort. Work hard to show the difference. Next question, please. You mentioned Avalon graduate got residency in California. However, Avalon University is not listed with Medical Board of California. Can you uh, give us more information about it, Dr. Ghani? Yes, 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 yes. We are listed, but unfortunately not on the first page. And that's why a lot of programs in the country follow California uh, recognition and accreditation. So if they don't see our name there, they quit on the first page. This is what our clinical department help Avalon graduates to apply in California is we, what we then is follow up with the letters and copies of the accreditation and we send a letter showing that the law was passed in California licensing board. We have that, uh, we have that uh, uh, letter and we send that to the student and to the program and say, look, your licensing board in California said that we can apply for residency here. So we have that, we have that document available. So when the student contacts us, there are programs are not aware of this. Some programs this just go on the first page and they don't follow up on the second page. You have to scroll down and there is a specific area where you have to click. The programs do not bother to do that after. So what we have developed is we have documents showing that the, the California board has allowed Avalon graduates and similar graduates who are accredited to apply for residency in California and we are happy to provide the documentation if you contact us or if the program wants us we can send them directly to the program next question please can we take oet in md5 or should we wait till clinical rotations no it's it's taken as a part of the clinical rotation this oet and clinical attestation is part of what cs used to be which was communication skill clinical and uh, and the language control. So this is uh, now in place of CS, OAT has to be part of part of the clinical rotation. Next question, please. If I want to apply to physical medicine and rehabilitation, will the school help in getting me rotations in this specialty? Uh, we don't have any, but we'll definitely uh, help. Uh, if you know any preceptors or programs, we'll be happy to contact them. Uh, you give us the name of the preceptor, we'll contact them and try and see if we can ar arrange an elective rotation for you. Yes, we can do that. Two more questions, Dr. Ghani. Is that it? Yeah, two more questions we have. Two more. Okay, go ahead. Does it make difference if we have a publication with physicians uh, from other country than US? Uh, it, no, it doesn't make any difference, but it depends on where the publication is. Is the journal that you have published is recognized by in this country? Or if it's a very reputable journal that it's on, on the uh, uh, PubMed, uh, the site for all the journals in the world, if it's mentioned there, then it will be great. It will be good. You can have it from there. But I would, I would uh, send this as, as a publication. Don't hold it back. Next question, please. Uh, with respect to residency, what is the circumstances regarding couples? Well, there is a specific uh, arrangement for a couples match, and it is encouraged. And some you you have to go on the site. And there is a specific site and you have to mention it um, in your, uh, it, you have to make sure you mention it uh, in your MSP, you mention it on the RS application and there is a separate site for the couples match. And some programs encourage that. 
so don't hesitate it's a it's a thing that you should look into and follow aggressively thank you dr gani that was all from my side that was the last questions okay thank you thank you for your help uh, amin you're welcome so thank you for okay. attending uh, this wonderful webinar and uh, we have like a few more questions but those those are the duplicate questions and we have uh, almost uh, replied all the questions some of the questions will be sent to dr gani and dr gani will be replying them in email if that is okay with you dr gani i will send you the list of the yeah, some of the questions please and if somebody else has uh, when they get home and think about something uh, i'll be happy to answer on you can write to me on my my email my email is given here it's all on the website also i'll be happy to answer your questions if i can thank you for attending and participating in this webinar thank you thank you and good night